Chapter 11 of Atlantic Classics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Grenholm. The Greek Genius by John J. Chapman. The teasing perfection of Greek literature will perhaps excite the world long after modern literature is forgotten. Shakespeare may come to his end and lie down among the Egyptians, but Homer will endure forever. We hate to imagine such an outcome as this, because while we love Shakespeare, we regard the Greek classics merely with an overwhelmed astonishment. But the fact is that Homer floats in the central stream of history. Shakespeare is an eddy. There is, too, a real difference between ancient and modern art, and the enduring power may be on the side of antiquity. The classics will always be the playthings of humanity, because they are types of perfection like crystals. They are pure intellect, like demonstrations in geometry. Within their own limitations, they are examples of miracle, and the modern world has nothing to show that resembles them in the least. As no builder has built like the Greeks, so no writer has written like the Greeks. In edge, in delicacy, in proportion, in accuracy of effect, they are as marble to our sandstone. The perfection of the Greek vehicle is what attacks the mind of the modern man and gives him dreams. What relation these dreams bear to Greek feeling, it is impossible to say, probably a very remote and grotesque relation. The scholars who devote their enormous energies to a life-and-death struggle to understand the Greeks always arrive at states of mind which are peculiarly modern. The same thing may be said of the severest types of biblical scholar. J. B. Strauss, for instance, gave his life to the study of Christ and, as a result, has left an admirable picture of the German mind of 1850. Goethe, who was on his guard if ever a man could be, was still a little deceived in thinking that the classic spirit could be recovered. He left imitations of Greek literature, which are admirable in themselves, and rank among his most characteristic works, yet which bear small resemblance to the originals. The same may be said of Milton and of Racine. The Greeks seem to have used their material, their myths and ideas, with such supernal intellect that they leave this material untouched for the next comer. Their gods persist, their mythology is yours and mine. We accept the toys, the whole baby house which has come down to us. We walk in and build our own dramas with their blocks. What a man thinks of influences him, though he chants to know little about it and the power which the ancient world has exerted over the modern has not been shown in proportion to the knowledge or scholarship of the modern thinker, but in proportion to his natural force. The Greek tradition, the Greek idea, became an element in all subsequent life, and one can no more dig it out and isolate it than one can dig out or isolate a property of the blood. We do not know exactly how much we owe to the Greeks. Keats was inspired by the very idea of them. They were an obsession to Dante, who knew not the language. Their achievements have been pressing in upon the mind of Europe and enveloping it with an atmospheric appeal ever since the Dark Ages. Of late years, we have come to think of all subjects as mere departments of science and we are almost ready to hand over Greece to the specialist. We assume that scholars will work out the history of art, but it is not the right of the learned and scholarly only to be influenced by the Greeks, but also of those persons who know no Greek. Greek influence is too universal an inheritance to be entrusted to scholars, and the specialist is the very last man who can understand it. 
In order to obtain a diagnosis of Greek influence, one would have to seek out a sort of specialist on humanity at large. Roman I. Since we cannot find any inspired teacher to lay before us the secrets of Greek influence, the next best thing would be to go directly to the Greeks themselves and to understand their works freshly, almost innocently. But to do this is not easy. The very Greek texts themselves have been established through modern research, and the footnotes are the essence of modernity. The rushing modern world passes like an express train. As it goes, it holds up a mirror to the classic world, a mirror ever-changing and ever-false. For upon the face of the mirror rests the lens of fleeting fashion. We can no more walk straight to the Greeks than we can walk straight to the moon. In America, the natural road to the classics lies through the introductions of German and English scholarship. We are met, as it were, on the threshold of Greece by guides who address us confidently in two very dissimilar modern idioms, and who overwhelm us with complacent and voluble instructions. According to these men, we have nothing to do but listen to them, if we would understand Greece. Before entering upon the subject of Greece, let us cast a preliminary and disillusioning glance upon our two guides, the German and the Briton. Let us look once at each of them with an intelligent curiosity, so that we may understand what manner of men they are and can make allowances in receiving the valuable and voluble assistance which they keep whispering into our ears throughout the tour. The guides are indispensable, but this need not prevent us from studying their temperaments. If it be true that modern scholarship acts as a lens through which the classics are to be viewed, we can never hope to get rid of all the distortions but we may make scientific allowances and may correct results. We may consider certain social laws of refraction. For example, spectacles, beer, sausages. We may regard the variations of the compass due to certain local customs, namely the Anglican communion, school honor, pear soap. In all this we sin not, but pursue intellectual methods. The case of Germany illustrates the laws of refraction very pleasantly. The extraordinary lenses which were made there in the 19th century are famous now and will remain as curiosities hereafter. During the last century, learning won the day in Germany to an extent never before known in history. It became an unwritten law of the land that none but learned men should be allowed to play with pebbles. If a man had been through the mill of the doctorate, however, he received a certificate as a dreamer. The passion which mankind has for using its imagination could thus be gratified only by men who had been brilliant scholars. The result was a race of monsters, of whom Nietzsche is the greatest. The early social life of these men was contracted, they learned all they knew while sitting on a bench. The classroom was their road to glory. They were aware that they could not be allowed to go out and play in the open until they had learned their lessons thoroughly. They therefore became prize boys. When the great freedom was at last conferred upon them, they roamed through Greek mythology and all other mythologies and erected labyrinths in which the passions of childhood may be seen gambling with the discoveries of adult miseducation. The gravity with which the pundits treated each other extended to the rest of the world because, in the first place, they were more learned than anyone else, and in the second, many of them were men of genius. The finds of modern archaeology have passed through the hands of these men, and have received from them the labels of current classification. After all, these pundits resemble their predecessors in learning. Scholarship is always a specialized matter, and it must be learned as we learn a game. 
scholarship always wears the parade of finality and yet suffers changes like the moon these particular scholars are merely scholars their errors are only the errors of scholarship due for the most part to extravagance and ambition a new idea about hellas meant a new reputation in default of such an idea a man's career is manque he is not an intellectual after discounting ambition we have left still another cause for distrusting the labors of the german professors this distrust arises from a peep into the social surroundings of the caste here is a great authority on the open-air life of the greeks he knows all about hellenic sport here is another who understands the brilliant social life of attica he has written the best book upon athenian conversation and the marketplace here is still a third he has reconstructed greek religion at last we know all these miracles of learning have been accomplished in the library without athletics without conversation without religion when i think of greek civilization of the swarming thieving clever gleaming-eyed greeks of the bay of salamis and of the hermes of praxiteles and then cast my eyes on the greatest authority my guide my teuton master with his barbaric babble and his ham-bone and his self-importance i begin to wonder whether i cannot somehow get rid of the man and leave him behind alas we cannot do that we can only remember his traits our british mentors who flank the german scholars as we move gently forward toward greek feeling form so complete a contrast to the teutons that we can hardly believe that both kinds can represent genuine scholarship the britons are gentlemen afternoon callers who eat small cakes row on the thames and are all for morality they are men of letters they write in prose and in verse and belong to the aesthetic fraternity they like the teutons are attached to institutions of learning namely to oxford and cambridge they resemble the germans however in but a single trait the conviction that they understand greece the thesis of the british bell letterists to which they devote their energies might be stated thus british culture includes greek culture they are very modern very english very sentimental these british scholars while the german doctors use greek as a stalking horse for teutonic psychology these english gentlemen use it as a dressmaker's model upon which they exhibit homemade english lyrics and british stock morality the lesson which browning sees in alcestis is the same that he gave us in james lee's wife browning's appeal is always the appeal to robust feeling as the salvation of the world gilbert murray on the other hand sheds a sad clinging tennysonian morality over dionysus jowett is happy to announce that plato is theologically sound and gives him a ticket of leave to walk anywhere in england swinburne clings to that belief in sentiment which marks the victorian era but swinburne finds the key to life in unrestraint instead of in restraint there is a whole school of limp greecism in england which has grown up out of keats grecian urn and which is now buttressed with philosophy and adorned with scholarship and no doubt it does bear some sort of relation to greece and to greek life but this anglican grecism has the quality which all modern british art exhibits the very quality which the greeks could not abide it is tinged with excess the briton likes strong flavors he likes them in his tea in his port wine in his concert hall songs in his pictures of home and farm life he likes something unmistakable something with a smack that lets you know that the thing has arrived in his literature he is the same dickens carlyle tennyson lay it on thick with sentiment 
Keats drips with aromatic poetry, which has a wonder and a beauty of its own, and whose striking quality is excess. The scented wholesale sweetness of the modern ascetic school in England goes home to its admirers because it is easy art. Once enjoy a bit of it, and you never forget it. It is always the same, the old reliable, the Oxford brand, the true, safe, British, patriotic, moral, noble school of verse, which exhibits the manners and feelings of a gentleman, and has success written in every trait of its physiognomy. How this school of poetry invaded Greece is part of the history of British expansion in the 19th century. In the Victorian era, the Englishman brought cricket and morning prayers into South Africa. Robert Browning established himself and his carpet bag in comfortable lodgings on the Acropolis, which he spells with a K to show his intimate acquaintance with recent research. It must be confessed that Robert Browning's view of Greece never pleased, even in England. It was too obviously R.B. over again. It was Pippa and Bishop Blogram, with a few pomegranate seeds and unexpected orthographies thrown in. The Encyclopedia Britannica is against it, and suggests, wittily enough, that one can hardly agree with Browning that Heracles got drunk, for the purpose of keeping up other people's spirits. So, also, Edward Fitzgerald was never taken seriously by the English, but this was for another reason. His translations are the best transcriptions from the Greek ever done by this British school. But Fitzgerald never took himself seriously. I believe that if he had only been ambitious and had belonged to the academic classes, like Jowett, for instance, he could have got Oxford behind him, and we should all have been obliged to regard him as a great apostle of Hellenism. But he was a poor-spirited sort of man, and never worked up his lead. Matthew Arnold, on the other hand, began the serious profession of being a Grecian. He took it up when there was nothing in it, and he developed a little sect of his own, out of which later came Swinburne and Gilbert Murray each of whom is the true British article. While Swinburne is by far the greater poet, Murray is by far the more important of the two from the ethnological point of view. Murray was the first man to talk boldly about God and to introduce his name into all Greek myths, using it as a fair translation of any Greek adjective. There is a danger in this boldness. The reader's attention becomes hypnotized with wondering in what manner God is to be introduced into the next verse. The reader becomes so concerned about Mr. Murray's religious obsessions that he forgets the Greek altogether and remembers only Shakespeare's hostess in her distress over the dying Falstaff. Now I, to comfort him, bid him he should not think of God. I hope there was no need to trouble himself with any such thoughts yet. Murray and Arnold are twins in ethical endeavor. I think that it was Arnold who first told the British that Greece was noted for melancholy and for longings. He told them that chastity, temperance, nudity, and a wealth of moral rhetoric marked the young man of the Periclean period. Even good old Dean Plumtra has put this young man into his prefaces. Swinburne added the hymeneal note, the poetic nature view, of which the following may serve as an example. And the trees in their season brought forth and were kindled anew by the warmth of the mixture of marriage, the childbearing dew. There is hardly a page in Swinburne's Hellenizing verse that does not blossom with hymen. The passages would be well suited for use in the public schools of today, where sex knowledge in its poetic aspects is beginning to be judiciously introduced. This contribution of Swinburne's, the hymeneal touch, and Murray's discovery that the word God could be introduced with effect anywhere, went like wildfire over England. They are characteristic of the latest phase of Anglo-Greecism. 
Gilbert Murray has, in late years, had the field to himself. He stands as the head and front of Greek culture in England. It is he, more than anyone else, who is the figurehead of dramatic poetry in England today, and, as such, his influence must be met and, as it were, passed through by the American student who is studying the Greek classics. Roman II. The Greek genius is so different from the modern English genius that they cannot understand each other. How shall we come to see this clearly? The matter is difficult in the extreme, because we are all soaked in modern feeling, and in America we are all drenched in British influence. The desire of Britain to annex ancient Greece, the deep-felt need that the English writers and poets of the 19th century have shown to edge and nudge nearer to Greek feeling, is familiar to all of us. Swinburne expresses his Hellenic longings by his hymeneal strains, Matthew Arnold by sweetness and light, Gilbert Murray by sweetness and pathos and all through the divine right of Victorian expansion. It has been a profoundly unconscious development in all these men. They have instinctively and innocently attached their little oil can to the coattails of Euripides and of the other great Attic writers. They have not been interested in Greek for its own sake. They have been interested in the exploitations of Greece for the purpose of British consumption. Some people will contend that none of the writers of this school are, properly speaking, professional scholars. Others will contend that professional scholarship is tolerable only because it tends to promote a cultivation of a non-professional kind. For example, Jowett was never regarded as a scholar by the darkest-dyed Oxford experts, and Jeb of Cambridge was undoubtedly regarded as an amateur in Germany because he descends to making translations. The severest classicist is able to talk only about texts. He is too great to do anything else. And yet, properly speaking, these men are all scholars. Murray represents popular scholarship to a degree which would have shocked Matthew Arnold, just as Arnold himself would have been poisoned to Nock, Nock, the author of the text of Euripides. But they are all scholars, and Murray, who is an Australian, and who rose into university prominence on the wings of university extension, and through his lyric gift rather than through his learning, belongs to Oxford by race and by nature, as well as by adoption. The outsider ought not to confuse him with the whole of Oxford, and the whole of Oxford ought not to disown him after making him the head and front of its Hellenism so far as the world at large can judge. Murray, as St. Paul would say, is not the inner Oxford, but Murray is the outer Oxford which the inner Oxford cannot too eagerly sniff at or condemn, because he is no accident but a true-bred Oxonian of the imperial epoch. The tendency of universities has ever been to breed cliques and secret societies, to produce embroideries and start hothouses of specialized feeling. They do well in doing this. It is all they can do. We should look upon them as great furnaces of culture, largely social in their influence, which warm and nourish the general temperament of a nation. Would that in America we had a local school of classic cultivation half as interesting as this Oxford movement, quaint and non-intellectual as it is. It is alive, and it is national. While most absurd from the point of view of universal culture, it is most satisfactory from the domestic point of view, as indeed everything in England is. If in America we ever develop any true universities, they will have faults of their own. Their defects will be of a new strain, no doubt, and will reflect our national shortcomings. These thoughts but teach us that we cannot use other people's eyes or other people's eyeglasses. We have still to grind the lenses through which we shall, in our turn, 
observe the classics. Roman three. Ancient religion is of all subjects in the world the most difficult. Every religion, even at the time it was in progress, was always completely misunderstood, and the misconceptions have increased with the ages. They multiply with every monument that is unearthed. If the Eleusinian mysteries were going at full blast today so that we could attend them, as we do the play at Oberammergau, their interpretation would still present difficulties. Momsen and Rode would disagree. But 10,000 years from now, when nothing survives except a line out of St. John's Gospel and a tablet stating that Fisher played the part of Christ for three successive decades, many authoritative books will be written about Oberammergau and reputations will be made over it. Anything which we approach as religion becomes a nightmare of suggestion and hails us hither and thither with thoughts beyond the reaches of the soul. The Alcestis and the Bacantes are in this paper approached with the idea that they are plays. This seems not to have been done often enough with Greek plays. They are regarded as examples of the sublime, as forms of philosophic thought, as moral essays as poems, even as illustrations of dramatic law, and they are unquestionably all of these things. But they were primarily plays, intended to pass the time and exhilarate the emotions. They came into being as plays, and their form and makeup can best be understood by a study of the dramatic business in them. They become poems and philosophy incidentally, and afterwards they were born as plays. A playwright is always an entertainer, and unless his desire to hold his audience overpoweringly predominates, he will never be a success. It is probable that even with Aeschylus, who stands hors ligne as the only playwright in history who was really in earnest about morality, we should have to confess that his passion as a dramatic artist came first. He held his audiences by strokes of tremendous dramatic novelty. Both the stage traditions and the plays themselves bear this out. The fact is that it is not easy to keep people sitting in a theater, and unless the idea of, of holding their attention predominates with the author, they will walk out, and he will not be able to deliver the rest of his story. In the grosser forms of dramatic amusement, for example, where a bicycle acrobat is followed by a comic song, we are not compelled to find philosophic depth of idea in the sequence. But in dealing with works of great and refined dramatic genius, like The Tempest or The Bacantes, where the emotions played upon are subtly interwoven, there will always be found certain minds which remain unsatisfied with the work of art itself, but must have it explained. Even Beethoven's sonatas have been supplied with philosophic addenda, statements of their meaning. We know how much Shakespeare's intentions used to puzzle the Germans. Men feel that somewhere at the back of their own consciousness there is a philosophy or a religion with which the arts have some relation. Insofar as these affinities are touched upon in a manner that leaves them mysteries, we have good criticism, but when people dogmatize about them, we have bad criticism. In the meantime, the great artist goes his way. His own problems are enough for him. The early critics were puzzled to classify the Alcestis, and no wonder, for it contains many varieties of dramatic writing. For this very reason, it is a good play to take as a sample of Greek spirit and Greek workmanship. It is a little Greek cosmos, and it happens to depict a side of Greek thought which is sympathetic to modern sentiment, so that we seem to be at home in its atmosphere. The Alcestis is thought to be in a class by itself, and yet, indeed, under close examination, every Greek play falls into a class by itself. There are only about 45 of them in all and the maker of each was probably more concerned at the time with the dramatic experiment upon which he found himself launched 
than he was with any formal classification which posterity might assign to his play. In the Alcestis, Euripides made one of the best plays in the world, full of true pathos, full of jovial humor, both of which sometimes verge upon the burlesque. The happy ending is understood from the start, and none of the grief is painful. Alcestis herself is the good wife of Greek household myth, who is ready to die for her husband. To this play, the bourgeois takes his half-grown family. He rejoices when he hears that it is to be given. The absurdities of the fairy tale are accepted simply. Heracles has his club, death his sword, Apollo his lyre. The women wail. Admetus whines. There is buffoonery, there are tears, there is wit, there is conventional wrangling, and that word-chopping so dear to the Mediterranean theatre, which exists in all classic drama, and survives in the Punch and Judy show of today. And there is the charming return of Heracles with the veiled lady whom he presents to Admetus as a slave for safekeeping whom Admetus refuses to receive for conventional reasons, but whom every child in the audience feels to be the real Alcestis, even before Heracles unveils her and gives her back to her husband's bosom with speeches on both sides that are like the closing music of a dream. The audience disperses at the close, feeling that it has spent a happy hour. No sonata of Mozart is more completely beautiful than the Alcestis. No comedy of Shakespeare approaches it in perfection. The merit of the piece lies not in any special idea it conveys, but entirely in the manner in which everything is carried out. Roman IV It is clear at a glance that the Alcestis belongs to an epoch of extreme sophistication. Everything has been thought out and polished. Every ornament is a poem. If a character has to give five words of explanation or of prayer, it is done in silver. The tone is all the tone of cultivated society. The appeal is an appeal to the refined, casuistical intelligence. The smile of Voltaire is all through Greek literature, and it was not until the age of Louis the Fourteenth or the Regency that the modern world was again to know a refinement and a sophistication which we call the Greek work. Now, in, in one word, this subtlety which pleases us in matters of sentiment is the very thing that separates us from the Greek upon the profoundest questions of philosophy. Where religious or metaphysical truth is touched upon, either Greek sophistication carries us off our feet with a rapture which has no true relation to the subject, or else we are offended by it. We do not understand sophistication. The Greek has pushed aesthetic analysis further than the modern can bear. We follow well enough through the light issues, but when the deeper questions are reached, we lose our footing. At this point, the modern cries out in applause, Religion, philosophy, pure feeling, the soul. He cries out, Mystic cult. Asiatic influence, nature worship, deep things over there. Or else, he cries, what amazing cruelty, what cynicism. And yet it is none of these things, but only the artistic perfection of the work which is moving us. We are the victims of clever stage management. The cruder intelligence is ever compelled to regard the man of complex mind as a priest or as a demon. The child, for instance, asks about the character in a story, But is he a good man or a bad man, Papa? The child must have a moral explanation of anything which is beyond his aesthetic comprehension. So also does the modern intelligence question the Greek. The matter is complicated by yet another element, namely stage convention. Our modern stage is so different from the classic stage that we are bad judges of the Greek playwright's intentions. 
the quarrels which arise as to allegorical or secondary meanings in a work of art are generally connected with some unfamiliar feature of its setting a great light is thrown upon any work of art when we show how its form came into being and thus explain its primary meaning such an exposition of the primary or apparent meaning is often sufficient to put all secondary meanings out of court for instance it is as we know the germans who have found in shakespeare a coherent philosophic intention they think that he wrote plays for the purpose of stating metaphysical truths the englishman does not believe this because the englishman is familiar with the old english stage work he knows its traditions its preoccupation with storytelling its its mundane character its obliviousness to the sort of thing that germany has in mind the englishman knows the conventions of his own stage and this protects him from finding mares nests in shakespeare again shakespeare's sonnets used to be a favorite field for mystical exegesis until sir sidney lee explained their form by reference to the sixteenth century sonnet literature of the continent this put to flight many theories in other words the appeal to convention is the first duty of the scholar but unfortunately in regard to the conventions of the classic stage the moderns are all in the dark nothing like that stage exists today we are obliged to make guesses as to its intentions its humor its relation to philosophy if the classics had only possessed a cabinet-sized drama like our own we might have been at home there but this giant talk this megaphone and buskin method offers us a problem in dynamics which staggers the imagination all we can do is to tread lightly and guess without dogmatizing the typical athenian euripides was so much deeper dyed in skepticism that any one since that day that really no one has ever lived who could cross-question him let alone expound the meanings of his plays in reading euripides we find ourselves at moments ready to classify him as a satirist and at other times as a man of feeling of course he was both sometimes he seems like a religious man and again like a charlatan of course he was neither he was a playwright roman five the bacchantes like every other greek play is the result first of the legend second of the theatre there is always some cutting and hacking due to the difficulty of getting the legend into the building legends differ as to their dramatic possibilities and the incidents which are to be put on the stage must be selected by the poet the site of the play must be fixed above all a chorus must be arranged for the choosing of a chorus is indeed one of the main problems of the tragedian if he can hit on a natural sort of chorus he is a made man in the alcestis we saw that the whole background of grief and wailing was one source of the charm of the play not only are the tragic parts deepened but the gayer scenes are set off by this feature if the fable provides no natural and obvious chorus the playwright must bring his chorus on the stage by stretching the imagination of the audience he employs a group of servants or of friends of the hero if the play is a marine piece he uses sailors the whole atmosphere of his play depends upon the happiness of his choice in the agamemnon the old men left at home form the chorus there is enough dramatic power in this one idea to carry a play it is so natural the old men are on the spot they are interested they are the essence of the story and yet external to it these old men are indeed the archetype of all choruses a collection of bystanders a sort of little dummy audience intended to steer the great real audience into a comprehension of the play the greek dramatist found this very useful machine the chorus at his elbow but he was on the other hand greatly controlled by it 
it had ways of its own it inherited dramatic necessities the element of convention and of theatrical usage is so very predominant in the handling of greek choruses by the poets that we have in chorus work something that may be regarded almost as a constant quality by studying choruses one can arrive at an idea of the craft of greek playwriting one can even separate the conventional from the personal to some extent the greek chorus has no mind of its own it merely gives echo to the last dramatic thought it goes forward and back contradicts itself sympathizes with all parties or none and lives in a limbo its real function is to represent the slow-minded man in the audience it does what he does it interjects questions and doubts it delays the plot and indulges in the proper emotions during the pauses these functions are quite limited and were completely understood in greek times so much so that in the typical stock tragedy of the Aeschylean school, certain saws, maxims, and reflections appear over and over again. One of them, of course, was, see how the will of the gods works out in unexpected ways. Another, let us be pious and reverence something that is perhaps behind the gods themselves. Another, this is all very extraordinary, let us hope for the best. Another, our feelings about right and wrong must somehow be divine. Traditional morality, traditional piety are somehow right. Precisely the same reflections are often put in the mouths of the subordinate characters, and for precisely the same purpose. Oh, may the quiet life be mine. Give me neither poverty nor riches, for the destinies of the great are ever uncertain temptation leads to insolence and insolence to destruction and so forth such reflections serve the same purpose by whomever they are uttered they underscore the moral of the story and assure the spectator that he has not missed the point as religious tragedy broadened into political and romantic tragedy the chorus gained a certain freedom in what might be called its interjectional duty its duty, that is to say, of helping the plot along by proper questions, and so forth. It gained also a protean freedom in its emotional interpretations during pauses. The playwrights apparently discovered that by the use of music and dancing, the most subtle and delicate, nay, the, the most whimsical varieties of lyrical mood could be conveyed to great audiences. In spite of this license, however, the old duties of the chorus as guardians of conservative morality remained unchanged and the stock phrases of exhortation and warning remained de rigueur in the expectation of the audience their meaning had become so well known that by the time of aeschylus they were expressed in algebraic terms no man could today unravel a chorus of aeschylus if only one such chorus existed the truncated phrases and elliptical thoughts are clear to us because we have learned their meanings through reiteration and because they always mean the same thing the poet has a license to provide the chorus with dark sayings dark in form but simple in import it was indeed his duty to give these phrases an oracular character in the course of time such phrases became the terror of the copyists obscure passages became corrupt in process of transcription and thus we have inherited a whole class of choral wisdom which we understand well enough just as the top gallery understood it well enough to help us in our enjoyment of the play the obscurity and perhaps even some part of what we call corruption are here a part of the stage convention now with regards to the bacchantes the scheme of having maenads for a chorus gave splendid promise of scenic effect and the fact that as a logical consequence these ladies would have to give utterance to the usual maxims of piety mixed in with the rhapsodies of their professional madness did not daunt euripides he simply made the chorus do the usual chorus work 
without burdening his mind about character drawing. Thus the maenads, at moments when they are not pretending to be maenads, and are not singing, away to the mountains or the foot of the stag, and so on, are obliged to turn the other cheek and pretend to be interested bystanders, old gaffers wagging their beards and quoting the book of Proverbs. The transition from one mood to the other is done in a stroke of lightning and seems to be independent of the music. That is, it seems to make no difference so long as the musical schemes are filled out, whether the ladies are singing, On with the dance, let joy be unconfined, or True wisdom differs from the sophistry and consists in avoiding subjects that are beyond a mortal comprehension. All such discrepancies would, no doubt, have been explained if we possessed the music, but the music is lost. It seems, at any rate, certain that the grand public was not expected to understand the word-for-word -word meaning of choruses, hence their license to be obscure. We get the same impression from the jibes of Aristophanes, whose ridicule of the pompous obscurities of Aeschylus makes us suspect that the audiences could not follow the grammar in the lofty parts of the tragedy. They accepted the drum-roll of horror and understood the larger grammar of tragedy, much as we are now forced to do in reading the plays. It would seem that by following the technique of tragedy and by giving no thought to small absurdities, Euripides got a double effect out of his maenads, and no one observed that anything was wrong. In one place, he resorts to a dramatic device which was perhaps well known in his day, namely the conversion of a bystander. After the first messenger has given the great description of Dionysus' doings in the mountains, the chorus, or one of them, with overpowering yet controlled emotion, steps forward and says, I tremble to speak free words in the presence of my king, yet nevertheless be it said, Dionysus is no less a god than the greatest of them. This reference to the duty of a subject is probably copied from a case where the chorus was made up of local bystanders. In the mouth of a maenad, the proclamation is logically ridiculous. Yet so strange are the laws of what goes on the stage that it may have been effective even here. Some of the choruses in the Bacchantes are miracles of poetic beauty, of savage passion, of liquid power. It is hard to say exactly what they are, but they are wonderful. And behind all, there gleams from the whole play a sophistication as deep as the Aegean. Roman six. There is one thing we should never do in dealing with anything Greek. We should not take a scrap of the Greek mind and keep on examining it until we find a familiar thought in it. No bit of Greek art is to be viewed as a thing in itself. It is always a fragment, and it gets its value from the whole. Every bit of carved stone picked up in Athens is a piece of architecture. So is every speech in a play, every phrase in a dialogue. You must go back and bring in the whole theater or the whole academy and put back the fragment in its place by means of ladders before you can guess at its meaning. The inordinate significance that seems to gleam from every broken toy of Greece results from this very quality, that the object is a part of something else. Just because a thing has no meaning by itself, it implies so much. Somehow it drags the whole life of the Greek nation before you. The favorite Greek maxim, avoid excess, does the same. It keeps telling you to remember yesterday and tomorrow, to remember the palestra and the marketplace. Above all, to remember that the very opposite of what you say is also true. Wherever you are, and whatever doing, you must remember the rest of the Greek world. It is no wonder that the Greeks could not adopt the standards and contrivances of other nations while their own standards and contrivances resulted from such refined and perpetual balancing and shaving of values. This refinement has become part of their daily life, and whether one examines a drinking cup or a dialogue or a lyric, and whether the thing be from the age of Homer or from the age of Alexander, the fragment always gives us a glimpse into the same Greek world. 
the foundation of this world seems to be the myth and as the world grew it developed in terms of myth the greek mind had only one background athletics and statuary epic and drama religion and art skepticism and science express themselves through the same myths in this lies the fascination of greece for us what a complete cosmos it is and how different from any other civilization modern life like modern language is a monstrous amalgam a conglomeration and mess of idioms from every age and every clime the classic greek hangs together like a reed. it has been developed rapidly during a few hundred years and has an inner harmony like the temple language and temple each was an apparition each is in its own way perfect consider wherein rome differed from greece the life of the romans was a patchwork like our own their religion was formal their art imported their literature imitative their aims were practical their interests unimaginative all social needs were controlled by political considerations this sounds almost like a description of modern life and it explains why the romans are so close to us cicero horace caesar antony are moderns but alcibiades socrates pericles and the rest take their stand in greek fable like pisistratus solon and lycurgus they melt into legend and belong to the realms of the imagination no other people ever bore the same relation to their arts that the greeks bore and in this lies their charm when the alexandrian critics began to classify poetry and to discuss perfection they never even mentioned the roman poetry although all of the greatest of it was in existence why is this it is because no roman poem is a poem at all from the greek point of view it is too individual too clever and generally too political besides it is not in greek the nearest modern equivalent to the development of the whole greek world of art is to be found in german contrapuntal music no one except a german has ever written a true sonata or a symphony in the true polyphonic german style there are tours de force done by other nationalities but the natural idiom of this music is teutonic i am not condemning the latins or the moderns indeed there is in horace something nobler and more humane than in all olympus the greeks moreover seem in their civic incompetence like children when contrasted with the romans or with the moderns but in power of utterance within their own crafts the greeks are unapproachable let us now speak of matters of which we know very little the statues on the parthenon stand in a region where direct criticism cannot reach them but which trigonometry may to some extent determine their beauty probably results from an artistic knowledge so refined a sophistication so exact that as we gaze we lose the process and see only results a greek architect could have told you just what lines of analysis must be followed in order to get these effects in grouping and in relief it is all no doubt built up out of tonic and dominant but the manual of counterpoint has been lost as the tragic poet fills the stage with the legend so the sculptor fills the metope with the legend both are closely following artistic usage each is merely telling the old story with new refinement and whether we gaze at the actors on the stage or at the figures in the metope whether we study a lyric or listen to a dialogue we are in communion with the same genius the same legend the thing which moves and delights us is a unity this genius is not hard to understand anyone can understand it that is the proof of its greatness as boccaccio said of dante not learning but good wits are needed to appreciate him 
one cannot safely look toward the mind of the modern scholar for an understanding of the greek mind because the modern scholar is a specialist a thing the greek abhors if a scholar today knows the acoustics of the greek stage that is thought to be a large enough province for him he is not allowed to be an authority on the scenery in the modern scholar's mind everything is in cubbyholes and everybody today wants to become an authority everyone moreover is very serious today and it does not do to be too serious about greek things because the very genius of greece has in it a touch of irony which combines with our seriousness to make a heavy indigestible paste the greek will always laugh at you if he can and the only hope is to keep him at arm's length and deal with him in the spirit of social life of the world of the beau monde and of large conversation his chief merit is to stimulate this spirit the less we dogmatize about his works and ways the freer will the world be of secondary second-rate commentaries the more we study his works and ways the fuller will the world become of intellectual force the greek classics are a great help in tearing open those strong envelopes in which the cultivation of the world is constantly getting glued up they helped europe to cut free from the theocratic tyranny in the late middle ages they held the western world together after the fall of the papacy they gave us modern literature indeed if one considers all that comes from greece one can hardly imagine what the world would have been like without her the lamps of greek thought are still burning in marble and in letters the complete little microcosm of that greek society hangs forever in the great macrocosm of the moving world and sheds rays which dissolve prejudice making men thoughtful rational and gay the greatest intellects are ever the most powerfully affected by it but no one escapes nor can the world ever lose this benign influence which must so far as philosophy can imagine qualify human life forever end of the greek genius recording by gary grenholm Chapter 12 of Atlantic Classics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Praise of Old Ladies by Lucy Martin Donnelly. It is everywhere the custom in life, in literature, to celebrate the young girl, to praise her pink cheeks, her shining hair, her innocence, her gaieties her muslins even, and blue ribbons. She has become in these latter days a proverb, a type, la jeune ville. Yet to the discreet observer, how gaudy is her charm, how showy and unsubstantial, and of the day only, when matched with the graces like those of the truly incomparable old lady. It is an antique convention that hurries off old age with decrepitude and care and quavering palsy, and it may be that the old gentleman is unamiable, that his days of strenuousness fairly over he becomes crabbed a lover of snuff and unpoetical but the old lady is a creature of another quality the refinements of age only enhance the femininity of her charm to her whimsicalities delicate occupations the fine lines that etch themselves expressively across her brow and about her mouth are all vastly becoming with what ineffable grace moreover she pronounces certain words in the elegant fashion of an age ago how softly the old indian shawls she wears fall about her shoulders what strange unlikely stories she tells of the beginning of the century i am indeed no novice to her charms i have been victim to the enchantments of a long line of old ladies from my earliest years upward when my frocks were still short and i still suffered under the ignominy of pinafores i remember very well following a friend of my grandmother's about and fetching big books for her she was an exceedingly learned old lady i take it 
Indeed, my grandmother always spoke of her as strong-minded, wherefore I am sometimes led to doubt whether she would so unreservedly have pleased my maturer taste. But in those early days my devotion impelled me even to the point of learning the alphabets of the curious languages she read. What constituted her peculiar, her romantic charm, however, was the fact that she had travelled in many faraway countries. I always understood it was their strange sons that had turned her skin the yellow colour of old parchment, and stopped the whitening of her hair at a grisly grey. This particular ugly grey I admired along with the rest. It suggested worldly sophistication and a cosmopolitan experience, as did no less her deep voice and blue-veined hands, and her habit of taking a vigorous walk in the morning before breakfast. Her daughter, she told me, was named Aurore. How I wish that I myself had been favoured with such a name! My grandmother was very different, much prettier and gentler, no doubt, but her daughters bore such stiff, old-fashioned names as Anne and Emmeline, and she herself had seldom left New England, and took only a short walk in the sun at noonday under a thin black silk parasol. At other times she sat beside her work-table, which had legs of twisted mahogany, and a crimson silk bag hanging down from the middle in a way I never understood. Out of this she occasionally brought scraps of faded old brocades, pink and green they would be, with a rare yellow or blue, still a little gay, and now and then, when the winter evenings until my bedtime were long, she even found bright-coloured beads in a small drawer at the side. Although she had been a proficient in music as a girl, I think she knew no language save English. Emerson, she read, chiefly, The Prayers of Theodore Parker, black volumes of sermons by William Ellery Channing, and sometimes, to me, in a very soft voice, Whittier's poems. In the late afternoon she was accustomed to play at solitaire, letting me sit at a corner of the table to look on. Not infrequently, when excited by the odds against which we were fighting, I forgot to hold up my head, and my long brown curls, falling down among the cards, threw them into disarray, and obliged me to sit at a penitential distance. My grandmother did not choose to be interrupted, but all the games in turn she invariably won by a deft rearrangement of the cards when she saw them going wrong. With oneself, you know, my dear, she would say judiciously, distributing diamonds among the spades, with oneself it is quite understood. Since the days of my grandmother and her friends, I have known a hundred other old ladies, if none more charming. There are, I dare say, persons who, in going about the world, meet people of other sorts, actors, perhaps, or ladies of fashion, or diplomatists, first of all, I fancy, to be desired, or spiritualists, or musicians. Personally, I never fall in with any one except old ladies. In a railway train, for example, I am sure to find myself opposite or beside one, and of late years they have generally had birds with them. The first I remember, with a bird, that is, was in a German railway carriage going from Berlin to Hanover. At least my destination was Hanover. The old lady herself was on her way home to Dusseldorf. She had been visiting her nephews and nieces in Berlin. She had a great many of them, she told me. From her fingers, covered with old pearl and diamond rings, I gathered that she was very rich, and from the bouquets of many colours, ranged in the luggage rack above her head, that the nephews and nieces were trying to persuade her to leave them her fortune. She wore, nevertheless, an air of extreme detachment, holding her long netted silk purse, through whose meshes the Prussian gold gleamed, tightly clasped between two fat fingers. Altogether she was a very portly and regal-looking person, and gave you the impression of being dressed in black velvet, though in point of fact I do not think that she was. But her mantle was fringed heavily several times about, and her hat, for she wore a hat with a brim that dropped slightly, discreetly, all around, was also bordered by a black fringe that just cleared her faded eyebrows and her black beady eyes. She had a gouty foot, too, she was quite complete, that rested on a little folding stool she had brought with her, and she rang imperiously for the guard. When he came she ordered coffee, bullying the cream-faced Teuton into bringing a double portion of sugar to feed her bird, a little green creature, disposed among the flowers above her head. It was with a good deal of difficulty that she struggled up to reach him, but to have him handed down would, she said, excite him unnecessarily. Mein Monchen, mein Monchen, she murmured, in a deep, tender tone, as she fed him each successive crumb. 
After feasting the bird, she turned her attention to me, and asking to see the book that I was absorbed in, she kept it until we arrived at Hanover. I had evidently read too much in trains, she remarked, alluding to my eyeglasses. Americans, she knew, were very foolish. Then she asked me the price of everything in the States, and of my traveling bag in particular, and quarreled with me as to the number of marks in a dollar. You'll find that I am right, she assured me, as I was squeezing myself and the brown leather bag she admired out of the narrow door of the German coupé. You'll find there are six marks in every dollar. Auf Wiedersehen, Fräulein. The last of my old ladies with birds I met only a month or two ago, on the way from London down to Southsea, the one place in all the world, I suppose, whither a thin spinster, accompanied by a ragged-tailed bird named Tip, should be travelling. She was, of course, very different from the German dowager, not so far on in years, and, as I indicated, exaggeratedly thin, shy, furthermore, and dressed in a worn black silk gown, with a lace collar at her throat drawn together by a hair brooch, and she spoke only from time to time to inquire if we must change carriages at Woking, meanwhile looking a little greedily from tip to the seed-cakes in the hands of three English schoolgirls, who, with shortish frocks and longish hair hanging over their shoulders, sat in a row on my side of the carriage, and scattered crumbs enough to have fattened a family of partridges. Old ladies at sea, though there without the embellishments of flowers and birds, I have found no less attractive than on land. I fell in with a party of them in the early summer, on their way to Carlsbad to drink the waters, with the exception, that is, of two or three whose destination was Kissingen, and who disbelieved altogether, I learned when we were a few days out from New York, in the rheumatism of the Carlsbad-bound ladies. Carlsbad, they assured me, punctuating their remarks with sniffs of their smelling bottles, as I tucked cushions behind their poor backs, Carlsbad was all fine clothes and frivolity and band music, than which surely nothing has a more wicked sound, and was by no means the place a person really ill would dream of retiring to for her health's sake. But it matters very little whether I travel in trains or in ships, or whether I rest quietly at home. My companions are rarely of my own age. If I am asked out to luncheon to meet the wife of a melancholy, doubtful poet who died young, and on my way to the house in question dwell not unnaturally on her youthful tragic grief, on my arrival I find myself confronted by a fat, kindly old lady, crowned with a large, black-beaded bonnet that shows a bunch of purple flowers above either ear. If I go to visit some beautiful house secluded in the country, it is an old lady who stands on the threshold. I remember such a mansion, built in Tudor times, and topped with chimneys calculated to make you sigh your soul away in longing. It had once been the dower house of an English queen, and in front of it two peacocks paraded proudly all day long. Others I knew went to admire it, and were entertained by the granddaughter, or at least by the middle-aged daughter of its mistress. Not so on the sunny morning of my visit. Lady W. herself was working among the flowers in her garden, and herself showed me back to the cascade and the tulip-tree, stepping over the lawn with the spirit of a girl, and apologizing with a girl's vanity, too, for her garden hat and gloves. She was the very flower and mirror of all the old ladies I have ever known, conscious, if you will, of her charm, and all the more charming for that. She led me into the drawing-room. She knew she held my heart in her hand to see her portrait, which, though painted by a celebrated artist, made her look very like any other old lady in velvet and a bonnet and furs. Her great gaiety, her beautiful eyes, the sweet curving lines about her mouth were all forgotten. "'I don't know,' she said to me a little stiffly, as she paused before it, and for a moment glanced across to her maternal grandmother, done by Reynolds, with pink cheeks and with a pink rose in her hand instead of a muff. "'I don't know, my dear, whether it is like or not, but certainly it is a very odd picture.' more delightful though each one be than the last it is but reasonable that the wealth of my experience among old ladies should have led me to certain discriminations old ladies i am prepared to say divide themselves into two classes the thin namely and the fat nor is this discrimination so artificial as it may appear another equally expressive equally conclusive could not be made and of the two but this is a matter of prejudice i prefer the thin as having commonly more wit, more liveliness, brighter eyes, and a taste for anecdote, 
generally wanting, I think it only right to say, in the fatter, kindlier class. My point of view is possibly ultra-modern, but what will you? La Grande Dame, so-called, vanished with the days and ideals of Louis the Fourteenth. At the end of two centuries or so, she is rarely to be met with. I have known her only once, in all her traditional fairness, but then she was of the essence of perfection. She gave one the impression of having never for a moment been out of the great world, of having lived, though in New York, perpetually with princes, les princes du sang, les princes étrangers, les grands seigneurs façon des princes. But what is my ungraceful pen that it should hazard a description of her, or attempt the splendor of her white hair and her white hands? Her graciousness, her elegance, her worldliness, are not to be compassed by a sentence. Among modern old ladies, of whom I speak somewhat less diffidently, I affect the more frivolous sort. My own feeling is, very strictly, that in old age the world of affairs should be left behind, and one's hours pass pleasantly among pleasant things. Age should be impulsive, light-hearted, brilliant, if you will. It should fill its days with flowers and music and embroidery. It should drive in low carriages behind plump ponies. It should write a pretty, pointed, epistolary hand, and read nothing heavier than memoirs. Intellectuality may be all very well in youth, but in an old lady anything beyond a delicate pedantry is unlovely. I like old ladies with decided opinions, with a gift for repartee and some skill in the passions. Curiosities, strange modesties. I knew of an old lady who brought her grandsons up never to look into a butcher's shop, deeming it indecorous, even indecent. Fantastic economies, eccentricities of various sorts, are delightful. And of all these things, the insipidity and jejuneness of youth perforce know nothing. The very pattern of young girls is bound by a straight-lacing conventionality. Formalities, anxieties, uncertainties sit upon her sleeve. She has no alternative, innocent creature, save to order her days and lay her plans in behalf of a charming old ladyhood. End of chapter 12Chapter 13 of Atlantic Classics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 13 A Memory of Old Gentlemen by Charlotte M. Hall. I have always shared the preference of the poet Swinburne for very old people and very little children. And, as it has happened, nearly all of my old people have been of that sex to which Shakespeare refers as coming eventually to the lean and slippered pantaloon. It began when I was a particularly roly-poly little girl of four with brown braids carried through the back of my sunbonnet and tied fast in its strings, that the unwelcome shadow of that blue gingham might never be absent. In compensation, I suppose, there was an equally roly-poly old gentleman, who used to toss me up in the long swing under the big oak trees singing in rhythm to my swaying self the chorus of a then popular song swinging in the lane swinging in the lane sweetest girl i ever met was swinging in the lane the great bending branches spread a canopy befitting a druid temple and the new little leaves like crumpled bronze velvet brushed my face as i held fast to the ropes all a-tremble with the spirit of adventure and a little fear that the earth was so very far away and was tossed up till I could peep into the nest out of which my pet blue jay had tumbled a week before. One of his brothers sat, a disconsolate fluff of faded blue feathers on the edge of the nest, and the parent bird squalled noisy protest at the sturdy red-stockinged legs invading their domestic privacy. The oaks in the swing and the old gentleman were the first milestones on my way to grown-up land. When my round fat arm had no longer to reach straight up to clasp my pudgy fingers around the thumb of my friend, when after many trials I caught the ropes and lifted myself without help to the wide board swing seat, then I was truly big, and trotted off to demand that a new mark should take the place of the one that had lately shown my height on the smooth gray trunk of my favorite tree. Smooth, for those wonderful oaks, centuries old and each many feet in girth, had been repeatedly stripped of their bark as high as a man could reach, and now, as if tired of renewing the ever-stolen coat, contented themselves with a thin, scar-like covering. 
since their sapling days perhaps slender conical teepees of buffalo skins had nestled in their shades and numberless brown babies had swung rockaby baby in a tree top from their limbs there was a broad hearth of stones between the spreading roots of one where buffalo steaks had been broiled and where other children had roasted the plump ripe acorn as i was fond of doing the buffalo robes for the teepees and deerskins for the gaily wrought moccasins had been tanned with the bark stripped from these very trees under which i played and swung in the little grove behind my beloved trees and bordered by the tiny creek where i waded and fished with a bent pin for small flat sunfish as bright as living sunbeams were bare poles still standing in a circle lashed together at their tops with strips of bark or thongs of rawhide there were wild cherries in the grove good in blossom and better in fruit puckery sweet wild plums and a great black walnut tree dear to myself and the squirrels and here the spirit of adventure thrilled me again for my fancy saw dusky faces behind every bush and the feathery cherry blossoms were always nodding eagle feathers on the head of the warrior just waiting to seize me a good deal of this was due to my old friend who had just come from the east a far away mysterious somewhere to me and who i am inclined to think secretly shared my dread of these brown people in whose home we were interlopers but some of it came from the tales to which i listened after i was tucked away in my trundle bed on winter nights and the men gathered around the fire to talk of indian raids and hunting and trapping adventures not a few of my old gentlemen at this time were gray-bearded scouts and hunters with great caps of fur and long rifles that seemed to tower above my head as far as the oaks children were rare novelties to those men of the plains and i was passed from shoulder to shoulder delighted with tales of bear and buffalo and fingering with awed hands the beaded shot pouches and belts of embroidered buckskin but feeling all the while almost as far above earth as when i swung over the blue jay's nest then we moved away and my next old gentleman was the very antithesis of the first small and thin and morose with a bitterness that almost hid the sadness in his face a misanthrope a miser an atheist said his neighbors but in truth only a man over whom hung the shadow of a tragedy that had darkened his life sometimes for days his mind travelled a crooked road as he said and then he would wander alone in the hills or shut himself up with his books and no smoke came out of the chimney and no answer was given to curious people who knocked at the door most children feared him but i did not that and my love of books made the bond between us he lent me quaint old histories and philosophies full of big words that sounded very fine as he rolled them off in a sonorous voice i learned to know swedenborg from kant and kant from comte and was in a fair way to become a philosopher myself when again we moved so far that we both knew the parting was final with fingers still pudgy i crocheted him a pair of marvellous green wristers as a farewell gift and he brought me a thick red volume defoe's history of the devil with pictures that made my brown braids rise up visibly every time i looked at them and a single german silver teaspoon which he said was to form the nucleus of my wedding silver years later some book thief of abnormal tastes robbed me of the treasured defoe but the spoon still reposes in solitary state untroubled by additions and most unlikely ever to serve the end for which my old friend designed it my last word of him was in an ill-scrawled childish letter from a schoolmate mr cushion is dead the doctor gave him some medicine and he died I was old enough to have a certain gladness mingle with my regret. The shadow was lifted. There were no more crooked roads to travel. My old friend was at rest. It was my next old gentleman who introduced me to Shakespeare and the lean and slippered pantaloon. A wicked sense of the appropriateness of the quotation flashed into my mind as he read it. I wondered, in fact, if the bard of Avon had been shuffling around in dressing gown and carpet slippers when it was written yet this untidy old man who loved shakespeare reveled in shelley and wrote heroic verse and greek dramas by the sackful had they told me been a brilliant soldier the pick and pride of his regiment the model in dress and deportment of all the fresh recruits surely the irony of fate is something more than rhetoric if he wrote in lighter vein he had lived in tragedy between the skylark and under the greenwood tree we had glimpses of bloody battlefield of disease-reeking famine-scourged southern prisons 
of narrow escapes, and men hunted like wild beasts. Very proud was my old friend when my own blundering thoughts first shaped themselves in verse. I doubt if Hamlet on his first appearance received such an ovation. And then one night the sacks of manuscript were packed, the little trunk strapped, and the daylight train bore away, we never knew whither, one who left word to no one, but three books, the battered Shakespeare, Shelley minus his cover, and a first edition of Whittier to a little girl. No word has come out of the silence, but when I am making air castles I like to think that some summer night I shall visit the Parthenon, and find my old friend writing Greek dramas in the moonlight. After that my old gentleman began to come in pairs and trios, so that they seldom threw such a clearly focused memory. The one whom I loved best was not really the best known. We were both too shy to realize in time how much we might have been to each other. He was a gentle, quiet, courtly man. I remembered that I always involuntarily looked for the pages holding up my court train of velvet and ermine, when he bowed to me. A scholarly man, whom one would have taken for some gifted professor or polished diplomat. And he was in fact an Indian scout, known the length of the West for his courage and fidelity, and unshakable honor. He would have stood with his life to a promise given the blackest renegade that ever harried his trail. I knew in a vague way that his was a name in history, but we were always too busy with Sir Edwin Arnold and the Vedas and Mahatmas to talk of that. I can see him now throwing back the silver hair from a face as fine as some old marble Jove, and repeating the Sanskrit tales or lines he loved best. Such as thou shalt see not self-subduing, do no deed of good, in youth or age, in household or in wood. It needs not man should pass by the orders for, to come to virtue. Doing right is more than to be twice born. Therefore wise men say, easy and excellent is virtue's way. Fit words for him who subdued himself with such gentle patience to years of blindness, never saying is the sun shining, but how beautiful the hills are in the sunshine. It was always daylight in his soul, till he slept at last in the sunniest corner of his beloved hills. There are many dear old gentlemen still. Indeed, now that I think of it, I have known but one young man at all intimately, and him I have not met face to face. Homer and Odysseus have been such satisfying friends to me that I have not missed Paris and Adonis. The flavor of old wine has been too long on my lips for me to change now and I shall be well content to have it said of me at last, Here lieth one who had the friendship of old men, and little children's love. End of chapter 13 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 14 of Atlantic Classics This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 14. Viola's Lovers, A Study in the New Morality, by Richard Boland Kimball. I sometimes think that our relations with our children, or our pets, are successful because we expect nothing in return. Yet, after all, the relations are reciprocal. And I have been thinking today of some of the things I have got from my old dog, who has been in our family for years and years. I have learned several spiritual truths from her, and I have learned them more thoroughly, perhaps, because she never had the slightest idea that she was teaching me anything. Dogs, of course, show various characteristics. Some are snobs, others take naturally to a low life, others again are aristocratic and reticent and self-controlled. But I have never known a dog yet that you could describe as exactly a moralist. Viola came to us out of the primeval woods with an effect of apparitional beauty. Rather a poetic name for a dog, perhaps, but there was such a union of grace and timidity, such a charm of silken draperies and russet ruff and tail almost sweeping the ground, that we were irresistibly reminded of a Viola we had seen recently. It was as if the dog said mutely, What should I do in Aurelia? She had evidently been through a terrible experience. A broken rope was around her neck. She was as gaunt as a wolf. Her eyes were almost iridescent with terror, like the wonderful eyes of some hysteriacs. 
imprison her soft hand and let her rave, and feed deep, deep upon her pierceless eyes. We did not adopt Viola, she adopted us. She followed us to the tent where we were spending the summer, and there she stayed with us, to remain on guard when we were away, to welcome us on our return with such a show of abject gratitude. I think a male dog could not have shown such a union of love and fear. Her spirit had evidently been broken. It became our task to lure her confidence back again. And here began my own education. If I spoke with, well, decision to my wife, poor Viola slunk to the ground. She thought the tone was meant for her. I would never claim to be a model husband, but I did learn from Viola, theoretically at least, that one can have good manners even in the privacy of the family circle. More rapidly than we could have expected, Viola's terrors left her, and she resumed the normal canine outlook on life, like humans I have known who have managed to counteract the false starts of their early childhood, obsessions regarding dark closets, snakes, or an avenging deity. I am not going to dwell on the intelligence Viola manifested after she had freed herself from fear. All dogs are wonderful, even when they are not intelligent. The most stupid dog I know mopes around the house and refuses to eat whenever his master is away, thus evincing an emotional sensibility more valuable than the smartness of the most Frenchified of poodles that ever trod the vaudeville stage. Unlike a collie of my acquaintance, Viola did not keep the wood box replenished, nor had she had a vocabulary of several hundred words, like another collie that I know. Still, she had an aptitude to learn spelling. When it was inadvisable to take her out for a walk, we spelled the words, vainly trying to conceal the fact from her, as we would from a child, and often, to this day, people stop me on the road and ask if I am the owner of the dog that knows how to spell. What I want to dwell on is my own education rather than Viola's, and this began in earnest after we had moved to the real country, and lived in a little farmhouse without any farm. Viola was a lovely ornament to the dooryard but it seemed a pity that there were no flocks or herds to evoke her ministering care. We didn't even keep chickens. We were ostensibly in the country to cultivate thoughts, such as they were, and while Viola might be said to inspire thoughts, they hardly gave her the necessary exercise. A collie should have a run of ten miles every day, and it was pathetic to see Viola lying in the dooryard, ears erect, eyes eager, watching, waiting, hoping for something to happen. I should not be surprised if her very eagerness attracted the thing she longed for. Our next-door neighbor, a man fully as fond of dogs as myself, was early attracted to her. He had recently lost his own dog, and asked if he might borrow Viola to help him catch his chickens, and if she might accompany him on the long drive he took every day through the countryside. With perfect good will, and in utter innocence, I consented. Little did I dream, as they say in the novels, of what lay before me. I had an idea that Viola would understand that she was merely loaned for these expeditions, that she would come back from them with undiminished loyalty, grateful to me for having given her the chance of exercise. But our friendly neighbor had a very taking way with dogs. Aside from the wonderful trips, which were enough to turn the head of any collie, he knew how to talk dog language better than I did. He knew how to pinch a dog's ear in the most seductive manner. With him, Doggishness was both an art and a science. There was nothing lovelier than the sight of Viola rounding up the chickens, shepherding them into their houses, holding down a recalcitrant pullet with her paw, or bringing in her mouth a dowager hen to her foster father. If I had the gift of a sculptor and wished to carve a personification of pride, I think I should depict Viola bringing in a chicken, her tail aloft like a plume of triumph, her eyes shining, stepping over imaginary obstacles like a high manege horse with an air of dignity that was really ludicrous. If an unlucky chicken got away from her, she always went across meadows and over walls, her beautiful voice vibrating through the landscape, sometimes breaking into an octave higher in her excitement. It was fun to see her scour ahead of the wagon when her new master took her out to help him pick up eggs. It was charming to see her come home sitting on the seat beside him, tired but still eager, looking to right and left, sniffing the air, learning all sorts of smell secrets which are closed forever to our supposedly superior human consciousness. Is it any wonder that it was necessary for me to go next door to get her, and that she followed me along the path with a certain droopy air that was hardly flattering? 
There is not much in the literary life that would interest an outdoor dog. I felt somewhat like a dry as dust professor married to a young and attractive wife who was being taken to all the routs and parties throughout the neighborhood by a distinguishingly youthful and handsome cavalier. I know nothing quite so shriveling to the soul as jealousy, nor anything so hard to fight against. I reasoned that Viola's expeditions were doing her good, that I ought to be grateful for them, and I repeated the antediluvian fallacy that my jealousy was only indicative of my love. Nothing that I could say to myself made any difference, and if I were in danger of forgetting how I felt, there were plenty of other persons to remind me. Well, said the fisherman, I guess you don't know whether that dog is yours or Lysander's. And my most intimate friend remarked genially, If I had a dog, I'd want it to be my dog, or I wouldn't want to have any. It was bad enough to bear the sympathy of the community. It was worse to witness the triumph of my rival. Often, after I brought home the drooping viola, Lysander would follow after her. Instantly she revived like flowers in water. She smiled. She was even coquettish. They began a lengthy conversation I could not understand. Little sounds from him, little grunts from her, and, if, by any chance, through a belated sense of duty, she happened to remain beside my chair, he surreptitiously snapped his fingers and made little sucking sounds that he fancied were inaudible, and then she sidled over to his chair. If jealousy is an index of one's love, it is strange that, the more jealous I became of Lysander, the less I loved Viola. Well, let her stay with him, I said to myself. I guess he won't object to having me pay for the license. She did stay. She sometimes stayed all night, and few things in my life have been more humiliating than my visits to get her. Lysander was glad to see me. Oh, my, yes. He welcomed me with a crooked, sardonic smile that I understood thoroughly. Viola knew just as well as he did why I had come, and pretended to take an interest in the wallpaper. As we walked home along the path, I scolded her, and she slunk to the ground and asked my pardon. Was there anything in her life that could make her conscious of any evil? Of course not. Without realizing it, I was exercising a sort of spiritual coercion over her. I was really condemning her for what was a true expression of Kali life, but she accepted my suggestion of evil. I have often wondered since how many persons in the human realm are suffering from a sense of sin as false as hers was. Of course, I did not philosophize the situation at the time. I simply felt disquietude when I was with her. This disquietude increased rapidly until I apparently disliked her, and I suppose that in my feeling for her there was actually an element of hate. Very well, I said to myself, in effect, there are better dogs in the world than ever were licensed. The next one I get, I'll keep for my very own. I had now reached my low spot, a center of indifference. And if this were fiction, the reader might expect an ever-increasing objective crescendo from this point onward, culminating in a stirring climax. Possibly Viola would rescue me from a burning building, thus showing that she really loved me after all. Unfortunately, I am dealing with the facts of a rather intangible nature. I have noticed that in life, Coffee and pistols for two are not called for so often as in literature. We pass the time of day with an acquaintance, discuss the play, and what not, little dreaming that behind that smiling exterior a spiritual crisis may be taking place. My crisis was rather interesting because it seemed almost physical, not so much in the subconscious brain ganglia as in the sympathetic nerve centers the process was taking place, the reverse process of what had taken place during my period of jealousy. I could almost hear a spiritual clicking going on inside me, as if I were composed of children's blocks which had become disarranged and were being replaced in a symmetrical pattern. One by one, the filaments of possession were being broken. That sense which in its grossest terms is really a sort of fatuous pride. Say what we will, most of us feel that we deserve praise and tribute for having selected so attractive a wife, for having begotten such charming children having no longer any more of a proprietary interest in Viola than I had in the wildflowers or the sea or sky, I got a fresh eye on her. I could not help admiring her, and I could not help admiring her for herself alone. Having no longer any taint of possession, it was impossible for me to impose my will on her, so I adopted unconsciously the courtesy one shows to someone else's wife. "'Well, Viola,' I would say, "'do you want to come home tonight?' 
You don't have to. She would look up and listen, cock her ears, consider the matter. Sometimes she would decide to stay with Lysander, and sometimes, strangely enough, she would decide to go home with me. If she came, she came happily, because she was exercising the prerogative of an independent creature. Her sense of sin or shame left her, and somehow we were all gainers, Lysander, Viola, and myself. He no longer snapped his fingers or made little sucking noises. These had been psychical reactions from my jealous emanations when we were struggling for Viola's favor. But we were now united in doing what we could to make her happy, and our friendship, which had suffered previously, in this new office became confirmed. What expansive talks we had about her! How he rushed over to tell me the latest example of her wisdom or affection, and when one expects nothing from a dog, it is rather pleasant to feel, suddenly, while struggling with a sentence, a damp, delightful nose inside your hand. Sometimes I fancy that Viola, informing her friendship for Lysander, had a prevision, for the time came when we had to leave her, and in whose hands could it be better to leave her than Lysander's and his wife's? Most dog stories end with the death of the dog, but I can assure the reader that Viola is still very much alive. Not agile any longer, she has become a privileged parlor guest, for the stairs are too much for her. Sometimes she even finds it impossible to bury a bone, and then she goes through the pantomime of burying it. She knows that we know that she has not really done it. Her assumption of achievement is ludicrous. Who says dogs do not have a sense of humor? She is beautiful as old ladies are beautiful. If she wore a lace stomacher, she would make a magnificent Rembrandt. Rich browns, tawny gold, and, in the heart of the picture, the spirit of her personality as mellow and pervasive as a flame. I don't see Viola often nowadays, but what I gained by renouncing a purely personal interest in her has extended itself somehow beyond what we know as the realm of time and space. This sounds rather esoteric, but what I mean is that I am very happy whenever I think of her, whether I am with her or not. I feel very near to her, though we are separated by a hundred miles, and I should not be surprised if, in the muffled woof, woof of her dreams, she often lives again what I happen to be thinking of at the moment. Wonderful runs with Teddy, the Cocker Spaniel, or the Homeric combat with the woodchuck beside Simon Brook. As I sit thinking of Viola, there happens to come into my mind, by one of those odd associations that have so little logic in them, an apparently trivial incident that took place a day or so ago. A couple of little girls stopped me on Arlington Street, Boston, and asked the way to Marlborough Street. It chanced that I was going to Marlborough Street myself, and I offered to conduct them there. But they were walking in the leisurely way of children, taking in everything on the way, and I soon outstripped them. At the corner of Marlborough Street, however, I turned and waved to them to indicate that this was the street they wanted, and they waved back to show that they understood. That was apparently the end of the incident, but two or three blocks up Marlborough Street something impelled me to turn. The children had found the street, they were following safely, they were evidently watching me, for as soon as I turned, they waved again. As I went up the steps of the house where I had an appointment, I looked back for the third time. The children, now became almost fairy-like figures, were still watching me. Up went their hands, and up went mine, and across the long length of the city street we waved in greeting and farewell. I do not know why the incident should have seemed to contain an element of real beauty, I was reminded of George E. Woodbury's poem, in which a somewhat simpler incident is celebrated. A boy, you remember, while playing, ran heedlessly into the poet, and the poem ends, It was only the clinging touch of a child in a city street. It hath made the whole day sweet. What struck me even more than the beauty of my adventure was the quality of permanence that it seemed to wear. In my underconsciousness there was something immortal about it. Can it be possible that our casual relations, where love is, our relations with children, or with strangers whom we shall never see again, or with the lower animals whose lifespan is necessarily very limited, can it be possible that these relations are less ephemeral than we think? Would it be too much to hope that the relation between Viola and myself is a small but permanent addition to the store of worthwhile things? End of Viola's Lovers, A Study in the New Morality Recorded by Robert Robinson